Jeffcom 911, what is the address of the emergency? For West Metro Fire Rescue and the community we serve, 2022 was a year where we saw a record number of calls in the addition of new resources to provide a higher level of service. From New Year's Day in January to New Year's Eve in December, our firefighters responded to more than 40,000 emergencies. There were structure fires, wildland fires, vehicle crashes, medical emergencies, and technical rescues, including assisting Colorado Parks and Wildlife in relocating a bear from a neighborhood in Littleton. Like most fire districts, medical emergencies make up the majority of West Metro's calls. And that's why in 2022, we added a new ambulance or medic to our resources, Medic 17. Medic 17, unconscious or near fainting. This is West Metro's newest medic unit or ambulance, Medic 17. We are an all hazards uh, emergency response fire district, um, which means that we respond to all kinds of emergencies. However, almost 70% of our calls are EMS or medical related. We continue to see increased population density in our district. Uh, along with increased population, our district is aging. With that comes an increase in calls, uh, 911 calls for service. So our uh, existing medic units are becoming busier and busier. And so we determined that it was necessary to add another medic unit so that we can be more responsive to the community. Um, this allows us to uh, not only balance the call volume we have among all of our medic units, um, but be able to respond more quickly to the area closest to the station. So obviously as an ambulance, there are primary responsibility are medical calls. Additionally, they respond to all hazards. So if there's a structure fire, they'll respond with the engine to support the engine, either in fire suppression or as a medical unit. And they can respond to hazardous materials calls, technical rescue, or in Station 17's area, we have Clear Creek nearby. So this station also specializes in swift water rescue. We'll look at heat maps, kind of where the majority of our calls are concentrated, um, where our existing units are located, um, how busy are each of those units, and uh, also when are calls occurring during the day. So we evaluate all of that so that we can really position our apparatus where they're most effective. Our job is to be as responsive as possible to the community that we serve. Where should we position these so that when someone dials 911 and they have an expe expectation that will respond quickly, that we're able to deliver on that expectation. And we are starting this new year, 2023, by adding another new ambulance, Medic 8, running out of our Station 8. The crew responded to their first call on New Year's Day. Caring for the community is our mission, and a unique way we provide medical care is with our Advanced Resource Medic, or ARM Car. In 2022, West Metro expanded our ARM Car staff and services. The ARM Car allows us to treat patients in place, potentially avoiding a trip to the emergency room. We have two primary objectives with the ARM Car. First is to provide definitive on-scene treatment for less acute complaints. So that would be things like nosebleeds, minor trauma, minor infections, um, potentially weakness depending on the cause. So that's our first objective is to keep patients out of the ER when they don't need to be there. And the second objective is to provide social resource navigation. And that includes really connecting our citizens with resources that they don't know exist. So that could range from getting clothing or food or potentially shelter, or even getting connected with primary care, um, things around the house that they might need. So it's just a way to go in and assess what needs a citizen has, and then try and connect them with the resources that can meet those needs. The ARM car is part of West Metro's mobile integrated healthcare program designed to reduce the burden on the 911 system and meet the needs of underserved communities. 
In 2022, we partnered with the Lakewood Police Community Action Team. The team works to provide services and resources to people experiencing homelessness. The armed car and staff provided on-site medical care to those who need it. In 2022, our crews responded to more than 160 structure fires. One was on the morning of October 31st, and two juveniles were arrested and charged in connection with that fire. This is what the first arriving crews saw at the Tiffany Square Apartments at 9th and Sheridan around 4.15 a.m. A large section of the apartment building was fully involved. Two people died in the second story unit when they were unable to escape. This video from a camera on 6th Avenue shows how quickly the fire progressed. The juveniles who were arrested were charged with first degree murder and arson. This fire at 20th and Youngfield caused $2 million in damage to several townhomes that were under construction. It happened in November of 2021. West Metro's fire investigators worked with Lakewood Police and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office to gather evidence and find a suspect. On April 15, 2022, Ryan Lee Martin was arrested and charged with arson. Martin was also charged with setting several other fires in the area. Across the country, 2022 was an above average year for wildfires, with more than 6 million acres burned. While here in Colorado, summer monsoons brought in much needed moisture, which limited the number of fires across the state. In West Metro's district, our crews responded to several smaller wildfires during the year. One was the Snow Creek Fire on the afternoon of July 12th. The cause was most likely lightning, as several witnesses reported lightning in the area about two hours before they saw smoke near Highway 285 and Highway 8. Firefighters had to hike in as there was no access for engines or other vehicles. Hello. Air resources, including two helicopters and two single engine air tankers, <sighs> dropped water and fire retardant from above. The fire burned about an acre. No structures were damaged. We had several other fire districts supporting our crews on the Snow Creek Fire. As a fire agency, we are always willing to help our neighbors. When the Marshall Fire ignited in Boulder County, West Metro firefighters were there that day, working into the night and then into the next week, first helping fight the fire and then assisting as the community moved into the new year and started the recovery process. Emergency traffic, we have multiple houses on fire. Go ahead. I need somebody to respond on an elderly female that's unable to evacuate and her yard is on fire. The Marshall Fire on approach was, you could tell it was going to be a, a devastating day. Knowing that the winds were howling and, and in the 100 mile an hour range. The first thing I noticed was just the amount of homes that were on fire. It just seemed everywhere we were going, there were homes that were fully involved. 5337 three, Marshall, a structure is about to be overtaken. We got into a neighborhood and there were houses burning up and down the street. Yeah, the fire is going to be moving in a eastern direction. And this is the situation where, you know, one house is burning and the whole thing's on fire. And because the whole thing's on fire and the wind's blowing, then parts of it and embers and smoke and flames and everything are all burning around the neighborhood. And then the next house is on fire. The Marshall Fire moved so fast. We had to determine whether or not we could do anything to the house with the time that we had, which was minutes. Cherryville Command, I have you with five resources at this point. Do you need more help out there? Definitely we were met with the most challenging fire environment any of us had ever seen. Hey, sir. The worst part we call it triage. So there was homes that were already beyond saving. But uh, we were able to find that line in the sand basically and uh, found a, a place where we could safely engage. We had a good water supply and we had enough resources to make a stand on many, many homes with uh, aggressive firefighting and uh, structure protection. Nothing but foundations right here. Yeah, three houses in a row. Oh, I think we stopped that. I think we're gonna make a good stop at this house. Yeah. 
So that house would have caught. Yeah, for sure. We totally saved that house. My initial thoughts when we pulled in and saw sort of the enormity of the devastation was where do we fit in? Where do we even start? That was sort of my first thought. Where can we start to uh, engage this fire, but in the safest way possible? And so we have to take a step back, evaluate the whole situation, see what we have going on, where what we expect the fire to do. And under the types of wind conditions that we had, that was sort of an unknown as we saw fire spreading from home to home very quickly. And so we had to be careful about where we set up, where we decided to engage the fire. But once we did, we had to make sure that we were able to get our people out quickly if the fire were to, sp to spread as fast as we had seen it already spreading. We want all units to operate in a safe area. We were covering an area about 105 acre footprint, but within that area, uh, there was uh, 21 streets we were patrolling and uh, roughly around 384 structures and, and one school. The resources assigned to me were uh, Brush Engine 9 and Brush 17 from West Metro and Brush 21 from Golden and Arvada Engine 56. Marshal Command, yeah, I copy that message, thanks. Just starting with four engines was an astronomical task, but as the command post and divisions started receiving more um, apparatus, at one point we were up to uh, 11 total engines that we were able to send around that community and find any opportunity for engagement to, to draw that line in the sand on that next street. Go ahead. Well, that first street we set up on where Brush Engine 9 and Arvada's Type 1 engine were parked and had secured a water supply, we decided that we were going to try and make our stop at the sidewalk that went between these two houses and at this house over here. So Arvada had this side of the street and West Metro had this side of the street and we were successful there. We had decided that this is where we were going to try and make our stop, that we were going to try and save this house knowing that this house was likely to burn down and we were successful in that. It took a long time because we had to wait, you know, we, the, that house was still gonna burn down and we did what we could to try and control it, but there wasn't any saving it. So we were able to save the rest of the neighborhood with only the, the one end of the street that burned. It's, it's tragic. That's still 16, 18 houses that all burned down, but we were in a position with the resources that we needed to be able to say, we're gonna try and make our stand here. In these situations, sometimes we can attach to a hydrant and sometimes we can't. And so our water supply is, is, can be fairly limited. We did identify that a lot of homes had garden hoses in the area and that was an unlimited water supply for us for quite a while. It was actually quite effective, especially during the heavy ember storm uh, later in the evening, around eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, we were getting a lot of embers falling on homes. And we used garden hoses as much as we did the hoses off of our engine. We had resources from all over the state that showed up on this. I think every, every agency worked seamlessly well together, engaged in the fight of our life. Division Zulu, branch one on Red Northwestern. Well, the common goal was to effect change, was to get in and to, to try and save and protect as much property and as many lives as we could. 416, I'm gonna start evacuating this area. Unfortunately, we did lose uh, a fair number of structures, but in the grand scheme of things, we saved way more than were lost. I understand that we have fire moving that way. We're just trying to get folks ahead of it. I think that's the difficult part is that it's easy when you're in that situation to focus on what you've lost. But I think what we have to do is step back and remember the victories that we had, the saves that we were able to make, and, and to focus on on the fact that the devastation for these families and these businesses is almost incomprehensible. Uh, but we had a lot of victories too, and we were able to stop the fire, not only in our division, but I know throughout, there's a lot of homes and businesses that weren't lost because of what those firefighters did. It's still settling in my head, you know, what we witnessed. We went in really unknowing what we were gonna see. That day we were staffed with an experienced engineer and two very inexperienced firefighters. 
and they handled themselves professionally. They did good work. They worked real hard all through the night. And when we went home, I knew that it would be something that I'd have to check back on them to make sure that they were okay with it in their head, but they had done good work. After the Marshall Fire, we had a lot of interest from homeowners looking for wildfire mitigation information. That's why we created this brochure available on our website. In it, you will find tips on preparing your home to survive a wildfire and ideas on what to take if you have to evacuate. Wildfire can happen no matter where you live in Colorado. Protect yourself and your family by being prepared. Training gets our firefighters ready to respond. Every West Metro firefighter gets about 150 hours of training each year. This prescribed burn in Bear Creek Lake Park in late September was one of those trainings in 2022. Real hands-on experience for crews from 10 agencies, including West Metro. The prescribed burn was also a training opportunity for a class of wildland fire investigators. More than a dozen small fires burning in Bear Creek Lake Park each one with a different cause and origin. But there is one thing they all have in common. The fires were set deliberately. Yep, so we've got our angle of char right and, and a protected zone. Protected zone. Now it's up to these investigators in training to find the evidence and solve the case. Okay, so we had a little pocket of here, just dry grass. That's why it's a little bit higher versus somewhere over here. Makes okay. sense, makes sense. We have 21 students and what we're teaching them is how to investigate a wildfire and try to determine the origin and cause because it is significantly um, different than investigating a structure fire. This week-long class is the foundation to becoming a wildland fire investigator, a scarce resource across the West. More than 5,000 wildfires ignite in Colorado each year, and like these fires here, the majority are human-caused. But often the details of how the fire started and why are unknown. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You see how it's pretty consistent? One reason is the lack of certified investigators. And there's also the sheer scale of the potential crime scene. You can look around and see how much open space we have to deal with. I've investigated fires along roadsides, dirt roads, things like that, where the possibility for an ignition point stretches a quarter mile, a half mile, even a mile, maybe longer. There's a little bit of curling on some of these. This is exacting work, looking at the smallest details inside a burned and blackened perimeter, trying to determine how the fire moved and from where. If you can imagine looking at a blade of grass, one side getting really warm and kind of brown, the other side remaining a little bit green. See how it's green here and not so much here. You can kind of get an idea that the side that's brown is the direction the fire came from. The side that's green is the direction it was going. That is interesting. That's what that is. For the students, the key to discovering the cause and origin of the fire is learning to look beyond the obvious, finding what doesn't belong. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to separate the weeds and the, and the leaves and everything else that's in there that should normally be in there and look for something like a match or a match head or a cigarette or a cigarette butt, something that should not be in the middle of this burned area. It's matches. It's matches. Those are matches. Oh, wow. Fire investigation, whether it's a wildfire or a structure fire, involves a complex process. While any fire can be caused by a variety of factors, it's vitally important for investigators to have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to accurately determine the cause and origin. They've put a lot of uh, effort into how they're looking at their fires. They're getting it down to the nitty gritty to where they're actually finding what it is we're putting out there. So the class is doing really well. Let's put a green one right here. When our crews respond to a call for help, they don't expect that they might be the ones needing assistance. But when a speeding stolen vehicle crashed into one of our medics, the firefighters on board found themselves being transported to a hospital to get checked out. Dispatch, Medic 11. Uh, we've been involved in a MVA, I believe, LPD is on scene, but we are stuck. Ambulance has rolled. 
The calm voice on the radio came from the firefighter sitting in the driver's seat of this ambulance. Medic 11, okay, we'll get that started. Can you give me your location? Dispatcher, I believe we're at 14th and Reed. Uh, both of us in the ambulance are okay. Hit broadside and rolled after a speeding stolen vehicle went through a stop sign at a Lakewood intersection. Choppy, thank you. We were uh, heading non-emergent to a call at 21st and Wads. We were heading west on 14th prior to the accident. Brittany Lyman, West Metro Firefighter EMT, and Tom Narone, West Metro Firefighter Paramedic, had left Station 1 less than two minutes before the crash, with Brittany at the wheel and Tom riding in the passenger seat. And as we entered the intersection at 14th and Reed, I recall a Jeep traveling a high rate of speed, blowing through the stop sign, uh, colliding with us just behind Tom's door on the passenger side. A split second before and the vehicle would have smashed into the door where Tom was sitting. Instead, it hit just behind. We started sliding uh, and then everything kind of slowed down a little bit and then we started tipping over onto the driver's side. We slid to a 180 and then came to a stop and basically just tilted over. For the two firefighters, everything went into slow motion as medical equipment, supplies and everything else went airborne. For both of us, it really slowed down after that point of impact when we started to spin into a 180. It was almost uh, movie-like how slow things moved flying through the cab. Everything lifted. It was pretty wild to see. With the ambulance on its side, they were able to unbuckle their seat belts and climb out through the passenger side. I climbed out first, then Brittany climbed out after me. We hopped up on the box and jumped down. It was it difficult to get out? No, not really. Okay. Neither of us were pinned or anything, so you know, did you have any trouble getting out of your seat? No, I, uh, being a shorter person, Tom helped me get out the window, but we were both able to get out easily uh, before anybody got there on scene. Got two paramedics uh, with injuries. And with a few bumps and bruises, they were transported to the hospital to get checked out. Yeah, I had some whiplash, I think more so I saw it coming, so I tensed up. Um, and then Tom just, uh, he had a split eyebrow after we got out and uh, some swelling to his eyebrow, but thankful that we didn't have anything more serious. There were three people riding in the stolen vehicle. One had to be extricated from the wreckage. All three were taken by West Metro ambulances to local hospitals. All right, sir, we do have medic two in route as an additional medic. They're in route emergency. Lakewood police have charged the driver, 20-year-old Armando Casillas of Denver, with vehicular assault, DUI, and aggravated motor vehicle theft. The two passengers have not been charged at this time. The police investigation is ongoing. Medic 11's crew is now driving a reserve ambulance, and this unit that was in the crash most likely will have to be replaced. That's because once it got back up on all four tires and brought here to West Metro's fleet facility, you could see damage that was not apparent at the crash scene. Not only the damage to the ambulance, but damage to the equipment and other items inside, including Tom's firefighting boots. His gear was inside this cabinet on the passenger side. With the steel shanks bent at a 90 degree angle, the boots are now souvenirs. Could have been a lot worse. Our firefighters know that they can't always predict what the day is going to bring, but some calls are more unusual than others. On the morning of August 15th, West Metro responded to an RV into a building at Pearson Colfax. Two people were injured in the crash, the driver of the RV who was the only person on board and a customer who was sitting at a table inside. Firefighters also rescued a dog that was in the RV, but not injured. In October, West Metro Tower 2 and Truck 14 responded to assist Colorado Parks and Wildlife in a neighborhood in Littleton with a bear in a tree. Firefighters first attempted to move into place to get a harness around the bear to lower him to the ground after he was tranquilized, but they were unable to reach him. Tower 2 provided a platform so wildlife officers could get into position to shoot tranquilizer darts and then everyone waited until the bear fell asleep. After he woke up and got checked out, the bear was relocated to an area more bear appropriate. After two years off, 
due to the COVID pandemic, in 2022, we were able to bring back in person the West Metro Family Fire Muster. Thousands of parents and kids came to our event at our training center. It's something we look forward to all year, the opportunity to show you what we do and pass along safety tips for home and on the road. We're already getting ready for the 2023 muster on Saturday, September 23rd. And finally, in 2022, West Metro was reaccredited with the Commission on Fire Accreditation International. It's an honor held by just 301 fire service agencies around the world. We've held accredited agency status since 2012, and this reaccreditation marks the third time that the Commission has evaluated West Metro. The evaluation focusing on the level of service we provide to residents and businesses and the district's commitment to the community. West Metro is also ISO Class 1 certified, one of just 114 agencies to achieve both accreditation and the top ISO rating. The accreditation process demands that we continue to improve our response times and our quality of service, even as our call volume continues to rise. It's a challenge, but it's our responsibility to protect lives and property, what we focus on every day of the year. We mean it when we say, whatever it takes to serve. Jeff, call 911. What is the address of the emergency? 